Welcome back. I am very excited to bring to you another episode of MPTF Influencers with Courtney Bailey. Today, the special guest is Greg Berlanti. Yay! Hi. Hello. Hi. Nice Bob's, Bob's hanging out for a couple of minutes because who wouldn't want to hang out and hear more from Greg Berlanti? <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Jen. So uh, thank you. We're on another episode of MPTF Influencers. Thank you, MPTF Studios, for giving us this platform during what is hard to believe we're almost five months into this pandemic. So here we are. The silver lining is that this content was created and we get this platform to talk to really incredible people. I, I'm sure this is probably the biggest audience, you know, Greg, you've spoken to. So I know you're really nervous. I'm a little bit because I'm a huge fan of yours. Um, so hi, Greg, how are you? Very good, hanging in there. Uh, you know, wish, wishing my best to everybody that's watching this and that's, uh, you know, uh, part of the MPTF. Um, you know, we've, uh, it was nice to sit down with you guys today. Thank you. So I probably need four hours with you, but I'm going to do my best to get these questions in 30 minutes. Um, for all of us watching, I'm sure most of you know who Greg is, but he is a multi-hyphenate like I have ever seen. So I'm going to go through some of those really quickly. Uh, Greg is a writer, director, producer, showrunner, philanthropist, pioneer, father, advocate, friend. Um, these are just the labels we know from research. I'm sure there's something like TikTok master or homeschool teacher or, no or <laughs> something in there. Greg, what's what's like one multi-hyphenate that we're missing? Give us one thing that maybe we don't know. Nothing. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I've, I've had to, to up my skills that, uh, you know, we've got a four and a one-year-old, my husband and I, and uh, I have not been great at teaching. Uh, I've realized that that my instincts that I was not meant to be a preschool teacher are accurate. So. It's really hard. I, um, I, have a... if I had to add one, I would say hypochondriac. I would have to add that <laughs> in my hypo... I think maybe that's the one that we've all added to our list recently. Neurotic, um, hypochondriac, either of those. You can, yeah. how, many, how many times have you thought you've had COVID symptoms over the last 15 weeks? I had one dark night where I was like convinced, <laughs> and then I, I realized I had caffeine too late. <laughs> yeah. I, I think we've all had those moments like, oh, did I just taste, you know, I've, did yeah. I taste my toothpaste or have I lost my sense of uh, taste and smell? I must have COVID. Yeah. Absolutely. And and trying to convince, you know, my four-year-old to wear a mask every time we go out and, you know, uh, is, a, is a struggle. But, um, you know, it's, it, look, you know, it's obviously an incredibly challenging time, I know, for for so many people. And uh, and so we grade our uh, challenges on, on a curve and, and really just, you know, in addition to some, some of the good that's come out of it in terms of just actually being with my family more and all of us being together. I mean, there, I, I can name one night in the last however many months that we, that we didn't have dinner together or have a meal together, you know, with all of us around. So there's obviously those kind of benefits, but at the same time, we wanna, you know, find all the ways that we possibly can and, and uh, my coworkers can to be supportive of other people that are going through a, a much more challenging time. Yeah, absolutely. I am. Um, I, I feel you on the mask. I have a recently turned three-year-old and six-year-old uh, girls, and masks are tough. I found that if the pattern is cute, yes. it, it, it helps. Yes. I try and convince him it's a superhero thing, and he, he puts it on that way. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Um. Perfect. I'm going to um, use that with my goddaughter. <laughs> That's yes. genius. You know, it's not, it's like, you know, there's so many mornings I'll wake up and he'll be dressed as something and I and I'll say, Well, why why aren't you that amenable to wearing a mask as you are to dressing up as Spider Man at six six o'clock in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We go through firefighter and mini mouse within like two minutes of each other. So it's a nice hybrid of covering all the bases. Um so great, just to just to kind of get it like quickly at the start of your career, because we have so many questions. You've so many things going on, um, which which is hard to uh, understand. I was reading a stat, by the way, of, I'm sure this is going to make you uncomfortable. You've had so many accolades, oh. but to have to tie Jerry Bruckheimer's record of live productions going on at the same time, and now you're at 18, or at least that was the last stat I read. Um, I'm not surprised you don't have time for another hyphenate in there, 
but did, did you always know that your journey in life, I mean, you went to Northwestern, you're New York, California, did you know that you'd end up in the entertainment industry and, and what, what led you to here? I always loved storytelling, you know, I mean, and, and that's taken evolution over the years. And when I was a young, young kid, I was into puppets and I would do puppet shows for birthday parties at, in the local community. and. And, uh, and then that changed into playwriting, and, and that's what I, I studied theater at Northwestern. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I didn't really, I, you know, I, I never, I'm, I'm not even sure I ever thought television in per se, maybe, maybe film. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I certainly watched a lot of, in retro, retrospect, I watched a lot of TV and movies. Um, but I just wanted to, uh, you know, initially, again, write scripts and tell stories. And I did always have a real love and fascination for old Hollywood, you know, and like the, the, the glamour of the, you know, and, and reading uh, quite a bit about the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and and uh, and the advent of television in that time. And so, you know, it makes sense, I guess, in retrospect um, that I sort of ended up doing uh, all this, but, but it wasn't, it wasn't my, my goal. I could have just as well ended up in the theater or for a while. I thought I'd be, uh, an American history professor. Like I didn't, you know, I, I just, but I did love storytelling. Awesome. And well, and, and writer, director, producer, showrunner, those are such different skill sets that you, you manage so well. Which one do you like jumping into the most? And I'm, I'm sure it's fun to put on the different uniform of all of them, but what's your what's your love, or is it all of them? Well, what I've really learned is that show running in TV and, and directing in film, you know, it's sort of, it, it, they're very similar in the, in the fact that you're kind of the arbiter of the story and the emotional experience for the audience from beginning to end. And, and that's that's where the most rewarding stuff comes for me because when I found that I've handed my material or stories off to other people, um, you know, and I haven't somehow been in charge of, of curating that process, I haven't been as happy with the results, you know? So, so I, I, in some ways I was driven to, to direct only because when you tell a story in film, it's sort of a director's medium. And so, you know, I got to sort of really make sure that the end result was something that, that I sort of saw in my head. In TV, it's been different. You know, if I'm show running the show, and because I created or co-created the show, you know, then it's sort of the same thing. But if I'm executive producing a show that someone else is doing that for, I try and provide them with the with the tools and the support so that they can have the, the most positive experience of, you know, when they first read that script or you know first come up with that idea that the audience has the exact same emotional experience that you sort of thought and you know in your head and and. There's a million steps along the way, and and so I, I guess I'm probably enough of a you know control freak that I, that's why I gravitated toward those roles. So um, Mel Shavelson, who the Writers Guild Library is named after, his idea was to start this TV station. It's all because of him, and what he said is, I was a writer first. I was a producer out of interest and a director out of self-preservation. Right, <laughs> that, that is very accurately put. I agree. <laughs> well said, Mel. Um, and Mel has a naming, right? He's he he is the namesake, and we. Huh. I know you know this, Greg, but we just had a resident, Ruthie Thompson, turn 110. Yes, congratulations! That's amazing. Uh, she's cool. it's unbelievable. She's she's literally been around longer than the MPTF. She is a force. Um, yeah, she's amazing. So now we have the Ruthie Thompson post-production suite. When, when visits are back, you'll, you and Robbie will have to, and the kids will have to come over. And we need the kid energy, by the way. Bring the kids over. <laughs> um, but, you know, Greg, one, one hyphen that I really love about you and that so many others, you're such an incredible advocate. Um, reading all the firsts that you have been responsible for, with others, of course, I, I know you always have a team, but... You know, um, I, I was such a fan my teenage years, and I loved the language of Dawson's Creek. You know, they, they spoke in a way that was different than other characters. It, right. was, it was very mature. As an English major, I was like, God, I wish I, that I could ever do that. But um, you, there was this great Variety article where you said, and I think this is so applicable to what's happening in the world right now. You said, I guess when, and this was about marriage and fatherhood. I guess when you tell yourself this may not happen to you for so long, you learn to live without the possibility of something like that. And then when it does happen, it makes it even more profound because you never thought you'd get there. That is incredible. I'd love to just hear 
how that made you feel, but also how that really translates, especially even like the black community. I mean, you're, you're always so full of hope when you're making changes and it's, and it's done with such class and levity and importance. And I think a lot of our black community is rising up because they never thought the changes would happen and, and we are seeing changes happen. So can you just tell me about how that meant for your life and, and how you see that in all the work you're doing? Sure. I mean, I would say, you know, um, well, I was a closeted gay kid, obviously, you know, and I didn't come out to my early 20s. And that was when I started to write about my experience as a gay person was when I actually started to get work. And so that really reinforced the sense of like, oh, wow, the more I actually tell the truth about myself and actually, you know, deal with, um, you know, what I've been through personally and the more personal it is, the more um, I can actually tap into my own creative voice and, and how uh, must that feel for everybody who has, you know, uh, um, uh, their own life journey and their own story um, to tell and how beneficial that must be for the audience. You know, a lot of the early TV stuff I did was uh, they weren't cop procedurals or, or uh, you know, they were, they were very much in, and they weren't superhero shows. They were about family and characters. So the storylines were so driven by, you know, what the characters were going through in their lives. That was the plot of the, yeah. you know, and, and it just always seemed weird to me when things felt too safe, like they weren't, you know, you, you would turn on the nightly news and you would see real issues or turn on Oprah and see her discussing like, you know, real issues that people were going through and, and wanting to get that same kind of truth into uh, about people's experiences into narrative shows. You know, and so that the characters were, you know, didn't feel like they were from a different generation, but they felt like they were from today at that time. And so that was, you know, it was it was sort of came, I guess, emanated from that. And then as I started to see, you know, just it was so profound for me to be a part of uh, of some of those firsts that you've started talking about and, and to see just just culturally some of the changes that would, you know, uh, not just happen just because of the work we were doing, but other people were doing. Um, and that, that level of sort of, uh, you know, I, I think just generally acceptance, you know, um, you know, and, and that, and, and knowing what that sense of acceptance felt like and how different it did feel, you know, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I can say, you know, when I entered the business, there wasn't, people were still really scared to be, uh, in terms of LGBT, you know, issues, they were really scared to, to be fully themselves, either in the mm -hmm. workplace, whether it was an actor or writer or director, they weren't. You know, it's still, it wasn't, uh, you know, you'd still hear jokes in the workplace all the time. And, you know, and I came out really early in my career, but I did come out during that time. And, and so to see that kind of change, how that happened and how rewarding that was for me personally, you know, it just made me want to be, you know, a part of that for other individuals so that to make sure we were creating a safe place for them to share their truth and to, uh, you know, and, and, and I think what, you're, you're seeing not just now, but in the last couple of years, I think in 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 film and in TV and obviously other places as well. But just to, because I, I I understand this business better, you know, is a real sense on the part of the audience and a sense on the part of people behind the camera and in the executive suites to begin to tell all the all the missing stories that haven't been told from our narrative, uh, and to do it in as authentic and as a, a respectful a way um, as possible. Um, and the audience benefits from that. We as storytellers benefit from that, you know, and the, the people that get to tell those stories benefit. Um, and hopefully our society and our culture benefits too, because, you know, we're, we're really are truly using this art form, which has more of a capacity to reach more people across the globe than it ever has in the history of storytelling. You know, you really can begin to, you know, change, um, you know, uh, and affect culture in, I think, a positive way by, you know, um, by, you know, by beginning to, to tell more of those stories. So I was, you kind of alluded to it already, but are you seeing that change yet? That's my, you know, we're at home. There's my husband going. Oh my God. Put I will the three-year-old down. My kids or, or dog don't wander in here. We will be like. I, I figured if that happened today, you'd probably be the perfect guy to like, it's, it's fine oh yeah. if you're used oh to yeah. it. Um, are you seeing that change in, in the pitch room and also behind the scenes? Like, I know that, the, I mean, I, I, I assume you would, but do you feel, of course, there's work to do, but you're seeing that tangible change, right? I've been seeing it start to happen for, for uh, you know, a few years now, more of a, 
to focus on it. Obviously, everything in the last few months has made everybody go, okay, that wasn't enough. You know, yeah. like like what we, everyone's been doing was just not enough. There's a, there's there's you can be focused on inclusion and focused on diversity, but that's not equality. You know, yeah. uh, gay people were included in society. And again, I'm speaking as a gay person in terms of what my journey was, but, but you know, we were included in the workplace, we were included in society, but I couldn't even think about getting married because it wasn't even a realm of possibility. You know, right. and, and I know personally the difference that that has made in my life, both to begin to fantasize or imagine it as a, a real thing, for it to have been made a legal thing, and, and then for uh, the results of that, how that's impacted me personally. Um, but, you know, that, that was with the cooperation of allies and support of people that weren't LGBT. Yeah. Um, and so I, I just don't think there's sort of a better thing than you can try and turn and say, is with, okay, well, how can I be an ally to other people's, you know, uh, experience and, and their desire to, you know, again, um, you know, tell tell their truth and to create uh, an environment out here in the business, you know, that is welcoming and 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 supportive and, and truly supportive, you know, and truly equal. And I, I do think that there's a lot of work to be done still in that regard. And and uh, and you know, and and it seems like there's a real fire lit in a good way for people to start doing more of that. Yeah, and, and I don't mean this term in a negative way because I think normalizing certain things is, is exactly where you need to be. And of course, it needs to be called out differently, but you've done such a good job of, like, Love, Simon. If, if everyone has not seen that, please watch it. Um, I see that there's a series now, right? Is, Born yeah. at Love, Victor, right? Yeah. Yes, I'm Born not a this- but they, 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 the, the people who wrote the script who were very talented created the series and um, and I've, I've you know done a wonderful job of continuing Got it. Yeah. well I, you know I, I watched that recently and I watched it with my six-year-old and what I loved is that it's what I'm trying to do is make that normal for her like it should it's not a, it, it, it's a conversation but you, you've made it in such a way that's this is a gay rom-com just like any other rom-com but the characters that fall in love um, bravo for all that you've done and and just to bring up uh, Robbie, who I am a big fan of as a soccer player now in this world and being an, uh, you know, an openly gay athlete, you know, I played soccer at, at UCLA and had, you know, half of my team were, were gay athletes. I never thought anything, you know, we use these buzzwords diverse. I never thought anything was different. It was, it was right. every, everyone's different, but the struggles that just my teammates on being themselves and to now see people being able to live their truth, um, so thank you, you know, for all that you and, and your team behind you have done for that. It's yeah, I know it's, it's been, uh, again, it's, you know, um, not why I got in the business. I'm still here to tell, you know, again, tell stories, that, that's, uh, you know, but, but that part of uh, being a part of that and has been, you know, ended up being one of the most rewarding elements of it. Um, you know, because uh, obviously I, I actually have lived uh, through the impact, you know, of, of, of those things. So let's get back to the storytelling. I'm fascinated to know how you write for so many different personas. I mean, you step into the shoes that you weren't born in. Right. But so how, what's your process in, in creating that voice? You know, so, so many times with some of the shows we do, there's, there's other creators there, but I, I, you know, storytelling is still an art form. And so I'll help them, you know, develop the characters and develop the the storyline and the narrative. Sometimes for the season, sometimes for the, um, you know, uh, just the pilot episode. It depends on the nature of the of the show, um, you know. And and uh, I've just done it so long now. I, I can kind of tell when we've kind of, you know, when we're arriving at something that you know you know has to go through a system. Then too, you're going to have to pitch it. To the studio, to the network, um, you know, and then it's going to have to be a draft, and the actors are going to read it. Then you're going to bring in production people, and they're going to have a thousand questions, and so mm-hmm. it's a lot of vetting of things. So that, um, but always trying to build stuff from the inside out, you know, um, you know. I think when people get caught up in like what's a fad now, or what is, you know, get too, you know, in the head of like, well, what will this actor think, or what is the studio or the network going to think about this, you know, it's it's more almost like you're divining the thing and you have to listen to the characters first and the story first as to what it wants to be 
Um, you know, and, and I ask a lot of hard questions of all of them. I do more of my creative work in the, in the mornings. I'm more of a morning person than a, uh, an, an evening writer in that way. Um, there are some uh, writers like the David Kellys of the world who can just sit down and pound out a script themselves in two or three days. I was never that kind of person from the, the day I took over uh, my first TV show, I, I realized how much I relied on that I could I could break stories fast, I could come up with stories fast, but I really need a team of writers to draft the scripts with me and and to uh, work on it with me. Um, I, you know, when I when I started out uh, in college, I did a little bit of acting, so so I, I do tend to find that when we're writing, I'm I'm you know I'm always trying to write scenes that I know will be inspiring to the actors. And then when we start to get the dailies on the material of, of those scenes, that's almost when I get even more inspired as to what the stories could be, because you're really, it's almost like playing tennis with, you're, you're hitting the ball across the net and the actors are getting those scenes and then they're bringing them to life. And that's the great thing about television as an art form, because it's not like, a, it does not like you, you write it first, beginning, middle and end, and then you go make it, you know, very often you're still working on the episodes while still the developing. Yeah. Not, so you're you're responding to the thing, and it almost has an evolution to it in a different way. Um, you know, sometimes an actor is so brilliant with a, a storyline that you just can you decide, oh my gosh, we have to continue the storyline, or we have to change it because look what's happening. Um, so you're really responding to that in, in on live time, and and um, you know, I try and be present. You know, I mean, I, I think there's always a lot of distractions in the day, and. And, you know, I divide my day up, uh, it, not necessarily between the, the hundreds of characters who we touch, but the, you know, the 10 or 12 showrunners that I'm working with most closely at that given time. And then, you know, when I'm with them, I try and be just all about what they need for me in that moment. Um, you know, and, and I find if we do the really hard work of getting the story right and the script right, then it, it makes the rest of the process a thousand times easier. But when you yeah. have, you know, and you miss something or, you know, you're just a little bit off, inevitably there'll be a problem with that episode either while you're shooting it or sometimes in post-production, most times in post-production when you're there and you're thinking, oh, gosh, you know, why didn't we think of this or why didn't we get this moment? And, and you're having to sort of, you know, fix it in post, as they say. It, it's funny you bring up David Kelly. I, I was a I was an English major in college and and then went to law school and I just figured, well, I never want to be a lawyer. I'll just be like David Kelly. <laughs> and then, you know, realizing how difficult it is. I, I pivoted and figured I'm just going to ask people for money and support all the charities and I'll just start well, 25 projects and never finish them. <laughs> lucky, lucky for everyone that, you, that, you're, that you're helping raise all that money. That's amazing. Okay. Well, uh, uh, thank you for saying that. I feel lucky to be in this position. I didn't know this was a career and to, to support philanthropy is it's pretty special. Um, I mean, let's talk about, you know, we're, we're in this time of COVID. We're nearly five months in. We're, we're in quarantine for that time or some version of that, some iteration. And we as MPTF are about to turn 100. And our, our motto, you know, we, we were founded by a pioneer who was an advocate in her time, Mary Pickford, um, a really incredible woman in the time when women weren't given the voice that they should have had. And our motto has always been, or our mission, taking care of our own. And you've seen so many productions shut down. I guess just talk to us about why now more than ever does that mission, and, and you've been so great to MPTF, kind of why you're involved with us, and also just why it's so important for everyone in this industry to take care of each other and provide that safety net. Well, I mean, it, you know, it's a, it's the, uh... I mean, one of my favorite things about this business is just how collaborative it is, you know, and that and that it really does uh, every day, every every dream or notion I've had for a story, you know, wouldn't have been realized without the work of everyone that's a part of that. Let alone making it better, but just making it, you know, just realizing mm -hmm. that. And and so what I've always felt buoyed by in the business is so supported in my dreams to tell these stories, you know, um, and, and, you know, very often um, you just want to be supportive back for those individuals, you know, in terms of the MPTF in particular, I will say that I've just, I truly have a, a love for the legacy and the history of Hollywood and uh, both in just in, in most of my spare reading time tends to be 
biographies in that space or autobiographies in that space and um you know and and uh and so you know any connection to everyone that sort of built this business and you know and i would say also just again as an lgbt person you know i've i've I'm, my, the life i have now I'm, I'm very aware that it exists because of all the sacrifices that all the people that you know came before me and and the, the opportunities that they didn't have you know, and so you start to swirl all those things together and you really feel a sense of, I think, uh, of responsibility of, you know, of being a part of this legacy, but also passing on hopefully better than you found it, you know, and, and um, you know, and, and so then there's heightened moments like right now where it's just, you know, really obvious that that, you know, the, the, the economic um, division, both in this business and in this country, you know, combined with the with the health crisis that we're now having. You know, uh, it shouldn't it shouldn't be a tale of two cities. You know, it, we really should, as much as possible, be figuring out um, how can we all be in this together. You know, and and so that people can make it through and and get to the other side. And you know, I mean, it's you know, so many times when we're on set um, and something comes up, I had someone say it to me really early on in the business, and I was like, ah, oh, we got another problem. And they said, you know, every crisis is an opportunity. You know, and, and so I think of a crisis like this as an opportunity to, to, you know, hopefully show people that we're in this together, but also to sort of, you know, uh, any rebuilding that comes after this, you know, to make a, a, a better community for, for everyone. That's fantastic. Um, I mean, the three, I, I know we only have a couple minutes and we have a couple fun questions for you, Great. but I, I, I hope everyone here is a couple takeaways from Greg, be present, collaborate, Every crisis is an opportunity. How wonderful is that? Um, so we, that, we do want to. That is kind yeah. of that is kind of the production way that yeah. you you face problems and challenges head on. You can't afford to sweep it under the carpet and deal with it later when you're in production. You have to, you know, solve the puzzle and not look at it like it's a problem. Look at it like it's it's a great challenge. You know, right. to to keep your brain you know, active. And I think because this community is filled with people from all aspects of production, there's a, a more robust um, sensibility of, yeah, it's a crisis. How do we get through it? Because yeah. that's what we do. We endure, we, we finish the story, and we go and move on to the next one. I mean, Jen, what, what you do with the residents MPTF 22, this, or MPTF Studio, now I'm combining both of them, Channel 22, now MPTF Studios, but what you do for our residents who, not everyone envisions that they're going to live in a home, right. they want to age in place, but they're at a home, it's utopic, um, they're able to continue on what they're doing, they're acting, they're writing, they're doing different things, I mean, what you provide it is exactly that, it's not necessarily a crisis, but what an opportunity to thrive and be vibrant. Um, okay, so some fun questions. Great. One, one we keep asking everybody, uh -huh. um, and I have two other ones, but what is your favorite film? It's a tough uh, one, I know. What's that? <laughs> it's a tough one. There's like a million. What's your favorite film? Well, and uh, we're, um, we're compiling a list through the pandemic of movies that are critical for everyone to see. Um, and you can change your mind tomorrow, but like right now, yeah. what's your favorite film? The one I tend to say to that question uh, was a movie called Cinema Paradiso. Oh, oh. it's already on our yeah. list, but yes. So, and I, I think what I realized about it, I saw it right when I was graduating college and, um, you know, and just in addition to how sumptuous and beautiful it is and how the story well told, it's a love triangle between a man, a woman, and the movies. You know, and and the movies, uh, the movies as part of a, that love triangle is hello. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, you know, so I, I think that was uh, you know, and I, I actually I walked down the aisle at my own wedding to uh, the theme from it. The music is. I was just, gonna say, yeah, the music in that film is. No. Oh, yeah. that's beautiful. I walked down the aisle to Tupac, so that's similar, right? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> that would have I, thrown more people for a loop if I did that. But <laughs> they were... Look, oh, it, 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 it threw some of the people in my audience. So, <laughs> some were very much ready for that. Others were like, ambitions of a writer. Okay, cool, <laughs> great. My dad loved it. Um, this is a tough one. When, when we were looking at fun questions, uh, 
<laughs> I come with I come about with some name that's probably not appropriate to say. What would your spy name be, Greg? Uh oh my gosh, you know I don't know. I it, I'm uh, I'm not I'm. I'm not going to be very creative. One with the initials PG in, in a lot of the Bond movies is the one that I keep coming up with. I'm like, yeah, that's probably not appropriate to say. I was a huge <laughs> Bond fan as a kid. And still to this day, when I leave seeing the Bond movies, I just like, I drive home a little bit extra fast, like in my mind, like I'm in a Bond movie. Totally. But it would, it would like be double O something. It would be double O something, but I don't know. Uh, so I would probably, you know, in that regard, I would want, yeah. uh, 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 you know, but um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I, 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 yes. Well, think about it. And when I can beg you to come back on again, because okay, we have yeah. so many more questions, then, yeah. then we can answer that one. Um, so, Greg, thank you so very, very much for all that you do for MPTF for what you do for the industry, for the amazing human being you are, and we are beyond thrilled to have you on today. It's a, my sincere pleasure to be here, and please, to everyone that is there, you know, uh, hang in there, and, and thank you for all you've done and the stories that you've been a part of. Amazing. So, one last very quick question. Can I get mine in before you do your last quick one? Sure, yeah, and then it's it, yeah. Um, so we are doing, uh, seven hours of original live programming three days a week here on the campus. Wow. Wow. And on Thursdays, we play either Celebrity Password or Mafia. And it's <laughs> interactive with the residents. So if you That's ever amazing. care to come back and it's be It's really on, fun. We love Mafia in my house. So that's great. Yeah, I think if we can get you and Robbie, and if the kids are running around, but to play Mafia, it is so much fun. I didn't even know what this game was. It's so much fun. Oh, I, I haven't figured out how to do it via Zoom and stuff. So that's really cool. It's a very, oh, uh, tr very trimmed down version, but it's still fun. Okay, okay good. All right, it's still fun. Courtney. Yes. Hit it was just the last question to close this. Um, we, we always want to close with a feeling of gratitude, and I'm sure you have a lot of answers. What's one thing that you are grateful for, Greg? You know, uh, my mom passed away a couple of years ago, and it was really soon. She died of lung cancer at a young age, and uh, you know, I'm still uh, grateful that she was that I was raised by her. I mean, I, and none of this, that most of what happened in my life happened because she was such a firm believer in me. And, uh, you know, and, and I think a lot about her these days because of uh, everything she went to, you know, health wise, I went through health wise. Um, and my heart just goes out to anybody that sort of uh, is, you know, struggling, particularly with any form of cancer right now and how scary and threatening that, that this moment in life must be, you know. I think she. Uh, would that's think really you know. beautiful. I know you're on the board of uh, Fat Cancer, which is an incredible organization. I had a friend who's coming on, a former basketball player, Matt Barnes, who's gonna come on the show next week. His mom passed within 40 days of the diagnosis. Yeah, uh, the, the uh, yeah, and the, and the, you know, the rates for individuals that have cancer for, you know, the, you know, for, uh, you know, the fatality rates for COVID are, are exceptionally, exceptionally high. So, so again, right now, that that's probably the, the most on, on my brain, you know. That's wonderful. Well, thank you again okay. for everything, Craig. We Thanks. will talk Got to you it. soon. Got it. Take care. All bye. right. Bye. bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.